thank you, um, Chrissy, for the very kind introduction. And uh, thank you um, as well for the invitation and the rest of the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about what my group has been up to these days on um, exploring hybrid material concepts for applications in solid state batteries that utilize sulfide based electrolytes. And um, I, I get this question very often. Um, you know, Nella, why why do we care about solid electrolytes right now? So these you know, solid electrolytes, lithium ion conductors, sodium ion conductors have been known for a really long time, but suddenly in the last you know 10, 15 years, maybe now 20 years, they've there's this new hype about them. And the answer to that question is that um Sulfide, so thiophosphate and sulfide based solid electrolytes show conductivities at room temperature that match that of liquid um, electrolytes. So, here, for example, um, we have in ethylene carbonate, propylene carbonate, lithium PF6, so like a typical standard battery, uh, lithium ion battery electrolyte in this line. And you can see how these um, lithium thiophosphate glass ceramics, the lithium germanium thiophosphate, uh, um, slightly lower um, lithium content and with the higher lithium content, all of these materials match or surpass the room temperature conductivity of the liquid electrolytes. And so this opens a whole new world of possibilities because the idea is that, okay, now um, <clears throat> we can replace all of this volume that is being occupied by the electrolyte with just a solid material and there's the thought of, of safety, right? So liquid electrolytes have flammable components and in principle, a solid is not as flammable. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. This is not exactly the case. There's more and more research showing that solid electrolytes are not really that much safer, but um, uh, in general, this is one of the ideas that we can replace the, the flammable component. The second aspect um, that is quite beneficial um, by utilizing solid electrolytes is the fact that um, the ion correlation, so from the perspective of the transport and the movement of ions in the electrolyte phase is significantly simpler. So in a solid electrolyte, um, we only have a single moving species. In this case, for example, just a lithium ion. And that ion you know, hops along a fixed lattice um, by, you know, occupying empty spaces or, or vacancies. And in the in describing the transport of ions, we can think about um, uh, correlation or non-random or deviations from random movement of charged species. And um, we can just describe that in terms of self-correlation. So the ion feels some sort of correlation and remembers where it was. So it jumps in one direction, but then it keeps jumping forward, uh, backward. So these are these um, uh, purple lines. But um, there could be that ions interact with one another. And this is what we call distinct ion correlation. So this lithium ion feels that there is a lithium ion here. And only after this ion jumps to a next available vacancy does this one jump. So the movement is somehow correlated. Um, now this, just explaining that picture is quite complicated. Now imagine that you actually have two charged species. So cations and anions. And now they can interact with one another. They can move in the same direction. So you can have positive correlations, you can have anti-correlations and you can have them between the anion and the cation, but also from distinct anions or distinct cations within each other. And so um, a couple of years ago, we, um, we combined the concepts of Onsager's irreversible thermodynamics along with linear response theory to be able to derive entirely generalized um, um, definitions for um, how these self correlations and distinct ion correlations could play um, a role in defining the transport that we observe in a solid electrolyte or a liquid electrolyte. And what you can see is that, for example, for the generalized ionic conductivity, we have a combination of self correlations, distinct correlations um, between anions and cations, and also um, the anions and cations themselves, uh, so uh, against each other. Now you can imagine that if you remove the anions altogether, then we are just simply left with the self-correlations and the distinct correlations between just the lithium ions. Similarly, the transference number, so then the amount of charge that is carried 
um, by the lithium ions in an electrolyte is significantly simplified when one only has one species. If you have the anions, it becomes very complicated. So transport is simpler when we um, utilize solid electrolytes. And we uh, now have materials that show ionic conductivities that surpass the liquid electrolytes. So what are the challenges? Why don't we already have you know, um, solid state batteries in our phones? Well, because there's a lot of challenges with these materials, okay? So they have very high ionic conductivities, um, but they're not very stable, okay? So solid electrolytes um, tend to show um, chemical or um, electrochemical decomposition against um, typical cathode active materials. Um, <clears throat> they also are quite unstable against typical anodes, so lithium metal, some of them even to like the indium lithium anode, so um, even silicon. Um, there's also the challenge, of course, of dendrite formation. If one is actually using lithium metal as the as a target anode, this is not a solved problem in a solid state system. The dendrites can grow along the grain boundaries, and also it has been shown that they can actually puncture solid um, electrolyte particles. Um, and then on top of that, when you think about a solid state battery and you kind of zoom in very, very carefully at the different particles, you will immediately see that now we have these interparticle voids, okay, that pretty much act as, you know, air bubbles within our battery. And this leads to very high resistances. And the, these interparticle voids are less of a problem in a liquid electrolyte because a liquid electrolyte just conforms to everything. Um, and this we don't have. So, you know, in solid state batteries tend to require significant pressures in order, applied pressures in order to get them running and keep them running. So with this in mind, okay, we have a lot of problems. Um, every system behaves quite a little bit different. And so we have a still quite a limited understanding about this idea of electrochemical mechanics in, in these, of these materials in the cells. Um, and that also limits how much we can improve them. As like a, thinking of ways on how to improve them. And so um, one of the questions that we wanted to answer a couple of years ago uh, was the electrochemical stability challenge, okay? So I come not from a solid state um, chemistry or solid state ionics background. I actually come from catalysis. And so I, someone asked me, how does one usually measure the potential window of an electrolyte? And I said, well, this is in a, in a liquid, electrolyte system. So let's think about a platinum electrode in contact with sulfuric acid, for example. You can do an experiment, which is called a cyclic voltammogram. You measure the current as a function of applied potential. And um, in doing so in, in this particular interface, you will get a, what this kind of shape here. And this is what we call a cyclic voltammogram. And so you have a region where there's nothing much happening. We call that the double layer region. There's some foundation. Then um, uh, so you form surface oxides on the surface of the platinum at positive potentials. Then you reverse the potential. You reduce all of those surface oxides to platinum metal. And then you have um, a slightly more negative potentials. So you have a, what is called the hydrogen region. Hydrogen adsorbs, desorbs. And this is a typical CV of a clean surface of platinum in contact with sulfuric acid. Now, what happens if I, instead of keeping the potential, the applied potential, at these limits, I expand it, okay? This is what happens. You will see a very sharp increase in the current at positive potential um, with an exponential behavior, so an exponential increase. And similarly, <clears throat> you will see that behavior um, at a more applied negative potentials. And then we say, um, this is the stability window, okay? The stability window of the platinum um, sulfuric acid interface is fixed at a potential range where we don't observe this exponential behavior. Oh, because, yeah, the exponential behavior, sorry about that, is because here you actually have water oxidation. Okay, platinum is a good catalyst. So you're oxidizing water into oxygen gas. And here at negative potentials, you're converting protons into hydrogen. So you're in fact degrading your electrolyte solvent. Yeah, and so this is how we define the stability window of that particular interface. Now, of course, um, in, in, when you have a metal electrode with a liquid electrolyte, the liquid electrolyte can conform to the specific roughness or 
you know, the profile of that metal electrode. We don't always work with atomically smooth surfaces. And so the liquid electrolyte needs to conform. But when we're looking at a solid electrolyte pellet, so a solid material with has intrinsic, you know, particle size distribution and so on that is pressed to a specific geometry. Um, and then we try to use metal electrodes to contact it from both sides. We can think about the fact that um, at a very microscopic scale, the solid electrolyte pellet would have, will have its intrinsic roughness and the metal electrode as well. And that means that the contact points between a solid electrolyte pellet and the metal is actually very small. You have a very small contact area where you're actually driving your current. And so um, what is important to know is that in any electrochemical experiment, um, the current that you measure is directly proportional to the area. Okay, so if you have a very, 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 very small area, you will measure very, very, very small current. Okay, um, and so in, in my thought was, okay, the contact area in this kind of configuration is just too small to actually detect any kind of redox chemistry that could be happening at the solid electrolyte electrode interface. So therefore it is difficult to determine what the stability window is. And so the suggestion was, okay, let's just increase the surface area. And so how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> there's two ways. The first thing is um, to, to do the, the control experiment. Okay, so this is just a solid electrolyte pellet and then you use a steel, stainless steel working electrode and the lithium indium anode on the one side and then you run a cyclic voltammogram and you pretty much see no current. And this suggests that everything is stable, that we have an extremely large stability window of these solid electrolytes. Um, but then if you increase the surface area by using making a composite working electrode, so you just add carbon, for example, and you mix it very well with your solid electrolyte, and then use that in contact with your pellet, then you get a cyclic voltammogram that looks like this. And then when you do that, you start thinking about, okay, well, what are those redox processes? Where does the redox chemistry come from? And what is the stability window? Okay, how do we define it? Because these redox processes, are, are they the electrolyte itself? Like what is happening? And so <clears throat> cycle voltammetry alone is not, uh, you know, doing just cycling in a specific region is not enough. So what we did was stepwise cycle voltammetry. And by we, I mean the doctoral student, <laughs> Georg, and he was very patient because um, we scanned very, very slowly. And we, in, in a stepwise manner, we increased the oxidative decomposition potential or the oxidative potential in order to determine when does the decomposition of the electrolyte start. And so you can see that there is a specific range in which the current is actually more or less stable. There's not much chemistry or redox chemistry. There's not that many peaks going on. And then there is a specific onset of this exponential increase in the current <clears throat> But then upon further increasing the potential, we start seeing more and more degradation and start seeing more of these redox peaks um, that we were able to assign specifically <clears throat> to the redox chemistry of sulfur, as well as um, up here to the oxidation of the um, PS4 tetrahedra and uh, GS4 tetrahedra in this particular case of the LGPS because we combined the measurements with um, XC to XPS. Okay, now, um, what does this tell us? The first thing it tells us that the stability of the electrolyte is, is greater um, than what was revealed by the non-stepwise CD measurements, okay? So what, what we can say is that in this case here, this redox chemistry doesn't intrinsically come from um, the solid electrolyte being immediately decomposed, but rather, that this redox chemistry that is happening here actually is due to the decomposition product. So the solid electrolyte decomposes and the decomposition products become redox active, okay? And so that was a, a very nice uh, result because it means that uh, we were able to demonstrate that the electrochemical stability um, of these solid electrolytes is greater than what is predicted by theory. So these bars here in black is the, predicted stability windows, okay, from theoretical work. And that would have been really, really bad because that pretty much kicks out any possibility of using these materials and batteries. Um, but um, these ranges that we show here in kind of yellow are kind of like the practical, okay, 
um, oxidative limits of these different kinds of thiophosphate-based solid electrolytes. Now, what is, uh, again, it's good because the stability is greater, but it's bad or not as promising because commercial and state-of-the-art cathode active materials lie at far more uh, positive potentials than the stability window of these materials. Okay, lithium sulfur is actually not bad. So if we're thinking about sulfur as a cathode uh, material, it's actually quite nice. And there's been many demonstrations or there's there's more and more demonstrations of also a state lithium sulfur um, batteries. But okay, again, we're, we're a little bit limited on the, when we wanna use kind of the oxide cathode active materials, which are the most promising materials for like high energy density applications. So, um, the question is, okay, well, what, where do we go? Like, how do we deal with this? Do we coat them? What do we coat them with? Do we explore entirely new castle chemistry? Okay, and this is where we, our group has um, decided to go and, and explore the concept of hybrid materials. How can we take established materials, either solid electrolytes, liquid electrolytes, and even polymer components that can be electrolytes, binders, and it's all sorts of kinds of electrolytes. Um, and identify their pluses, okay? So solid electrolytes with high room temperature ionic conductivity, liquid electrolytes have the plus that they have maximized interfacial contact whenever we are using planar electrodes or just in general, they can conform, right? To um, available volume. Um, and polymers in general have much better mechanical uh, and, and processability properties. Yeah, than uh, liquid electrolytes, uh, liquid systems or, or solids. Now, of course, they have their own intrinsic challenges. Um, I mentioned already the stability challenges of the solid electrolytes, the flammability and correlated ion transport in the liquids. Polymers, uh, however, tend to have significantly lower ionic conductivities. Um, and sometimes they also have poor contact um, with, with planar um, contacts. Uh, yeah, so uh, current collectors. And so the challenge that we pose ourselves is how do we make hybrids and we only capitalize on the pros, right? So we don't mix two bad things together, right? Um, and how do we characterize those, the, the, the resulting interfaces? And so today I would like to um, show you two brief stories. Um, the first one is um, part of our work that is done within the context of the FETSPAT cluster. Um, this is a cluster of excellence supported by the Ministry for Research and Education here in Germany, the FETSPAT. Um, and here we are part of a consortium of, I don't know, I think there's like at least 75 PIs from all over Germany and in close contact with um, industry trying to identify uh, different approaches for developing solid state batteries. And so here we are combining um, a quite, at this point, well-established um, solid electrolyte, the lithium chloride and gyrodite with reasonable ionic conductivities at room temperature um, with um, this uh, polymer drafted polyroxetane structure. So it has a PO backbone um, cyclodextrin units and polycarprolactone, so PS, PCL side chains that are shown here in orange. Um, this is one of the generations of, of this polymer. I apologize because the references here didn't show up, but um, this is one of the generations that has been published before. Um, this is a single ion conductor. Okay, there, there's no solvent in here doing anything. And it actually shows quite competitive ionic conductivities, both at 60 Celsius and even at 25 Celsius for being an entirely polymer-based electrolyte. So the idea is to try and mix these two things together and, and figure out if we can you know, generate hybrid electrolytes um, that are somehow useful for solid state batteries. Okay, so what do we do? We mix them, typical hand, you know, mortar and pencil grinding. So a little bit of shake and bake, it's, it's nothing too complicated at the moment. And what we were, we explored initially was, okay, what happens to the total ionic conductivity as we increase the polymer content? Okay, so again, our main ion conducting phase is actually the, the sulfide based material, so the archiridite and not the polymer. And what we can see is of course that um, the more we increase the amount of polymer, the more the total ionic conductivity of the hybrid electrolyte decreases. These are the impedance spectra that we collected. And in fact, when we have extremely, not extremely, but much larger um, concentrations of 
polymer electrolytes. So these are these resistances shown here. We already start seeing some loops um, in the impedance spectra, um, which for those that um, in the audience that may know about impedance spectroscopy, this already hints a little bit at instabilities between the two phases. Um, um, yeah, between the two phases. But there is a specific range, so somewhere here, yeah, below five weight percent uh, of polymer, where we are still still above one millisiemen per centimeter at room temperature of ionic conductivity. And we also observed that doing a small heat treatment um, slightly has and improves the conductivity of the whole hybrid electrolyte briefly. So. Um, for the data that follows up everything um, I'm showing after the slide regarding this project, this heat treatment has been applied so that we are already kind of working at the ideal starting point or the most improved starting point for these hybrid electrolytes. Okay, so um, we make these hybrid electrolytes and then we have to try them somewhere. Um, these ionic conductivities are not competitive enough for these materials to be used in the separator phase. Okay, they're too low. You need much faster solid electrolytes for that. So we're looking at them in terms of cathode composites, so as components for cathodes. So how do we usually make that? We take our hybrid electrolyte and we mix it with our cathode active material. In this case, it's a single crystal NMC. Again, simple mortar and pestle at the moment at a specific weight ratio. And then you obtain a picture when you're building your cell that looks kind of like this. You have your stainless steel kind of stamp as the current collector and your cathode composite is a mixture of cathode active material particles and solid electrolyte particles. And then the hybrid electrolyte or not the hybrid, the polymer electrolyte is not shown at the moment, but it's somehow mixed in there, right? Um, and then you have your solid electrolyte layer. And, and when you're putting this in a battery, you need to think about the fact that your electrons are going to move along the cathode active material particles, okay, in electronic current. Your ions are going to move primarily through the solid electrolyte or hybrid electrolyte, yeah, so the polymer is there a little bit, and they need to meet so that you can actually do the proper charging and discharging. Now, as this picture suggests, um, you can imagine that, you know, the ions, it, the, the the transport is tortuous is how this is usually described. And so I am identifying and quantifying transport limitations in these composites that we are preparing. These cathode composites is crucial to try and figure out and, and think about how to optimize these cells and how do we do that? Again, I come from um, solid liquid interfaces. So here is an example of um, a substrate, some sort of back contact with like a porous electro, think about like carbon on, on a substrate, a very thin film. Um, <clears throat> you can have electrons moving along the carbon material, and then you have ions that move along the pores in order to do the whole charge compensation, okay? And again, because these pores can be quite small depending on the, you know, how the, the microstructure of, of the electrode itself, the porous part of the electrode. Um, you know, you can imagine that this is difficult for the ion to move as well as for the electron. So we often talk about this as a tortuous transport, and we can describe that usually as a distribution of impedances. So we say, okay, this pore, we idealize it, and we describe it kind of as like a cylinder-like figure. And then we say, okay, as the ion moves from the bulk towards the substrate, there's a distribution of impedances that describe it. There is another distribution of impedances that describe the transport of the electron in the material itself. And then there is also a distribution of an impedance response that describes the interface itself here in orange, okay? And this all this distribution of impedances must be distance dependent, okay? Depending on the thickness of the electrode. And um, using these principles or, or this, this theory, this is called transmission line modeling, um, to, to describe impedance data um, and using the right conditions, that means building the cells in, in the correct way, we can actually distinguish and quantify partial ionic transport and partial electronic transport in our composite, castle composites, okay? And so specifically, we can build cells that have an ion blocking configuration. That means that the ions, um, literally get blocked okay they get so this is stainless steel and we put our cathode composite in the middle 
And so that means that if we apply a current, this is uh, a metal, electrons are going to come from one side, they are going to move along the NMC particles in the cathode composite and going to reach the other side. Whereas the lithium ions are going to try and move, okay, but they are going to get blocked. They cannot be, you know, oxidized or reduced or anything at the solid, uh, solid state, at the state of steel electrodes. And so under these configuration, you obtain the partial electronic conductivity of the cathode composite, and then you can do electron blocking configurations, and you pretty much block the electrons by adding two layers of solid electrolyte on each side of the cathode composite. Okay, and so now you have a reversible electrode. This could be lithium metal, for example, but our solid electrodes are not stable against lithium metal, so we used indium lithium um, alloys um, to prevent full decomposition. And so now the lithium ions can move from one side, from one electrode, all the way to the other, whereas the electro uh, electrons, sorry, are going to kind of get stuck here. Okay, we also we have to think about electron neutrality, but they kind of get blocked. Okay, and so when we have these kinds of configurations, you get impedance spectra that looks like this. So um, in the most simpler case, we just have simple resistors to describe the ionic transport and simple resistors to describe the electronic transport um, and, and a constant phase element to try and describe um, the charge storage between the two different particles. Um, you can have, in this simplest case, you will have something that looks like this, this half teardrop shape. Um, and depending if you have, yeah, electron blocking or ionic blocking, you can make it a little bit more complicated. Um, in the case of the electronic um, transport, when you say, okay, um, electrons also feel, so there is an intrinsic electronic uh, conductivity um, in an NMC particle, so kind of like bulk, and then there is of course, another resistance of getting the electrons of going from one particle to another one. So the, the, that results in this additional semicircle, okay, where one takes into account um, that additional interparticle resistance. Okay, and so in principle, an impedance spectrum, um, for those that uh, don't know, maybe I can explain that real quick. So you have a real and an imaginary axis. Um, you measure this as a function of frequencies, okay, so frequencies are increasing in this direction. And so at high frequencies, irrespective of the configuration, the cell configuration you are using, you are actually going to be measuring a combination of both the electronic and the ionic resistances. Okay, you cannot deconvolute them at the beginning. You can only deconvolute them at very low frequencies where you are actually blocking their transport in the longer timescales. Okay. Good. So you pretty much just read it out from the impedance spectrum and you um, know the thickness of your cathode composite when you were preparing it. And so you can then, you know, you get these nice impedance spectra, you fit it with the transmission line model, and you can extract these values, these kind of plots, um, where we can look at the effective or partial electronic conductivity of the composites as a function of polymer concept or the ionic one. And so the first thing that we can see is that um, um, the incorporating polymer in our hybrid electrolyte at increasing it does not affect the electronic transport. And this is good, okay? Because we do not want to be, we don't want to lose, you know, and, and kill the, the transport of electrons in our NMC, okay? Um, however, upon increasing uh, the polymer content, we see a significant decrease in the partial ionic conductivities of the of the cathode composites. Okay, so it drops to about half of it. Okay. Um, and, and, and then the question is, okay, well, how does this kind of transport that we've been able to study very carefully, how does that translate <clears throat> into at the cell level? Okay, so um, what we did then, okay, we took our composites, we built cells with them, um, and here is just kind of the summary. The, the cells are still running, so um, this is why some of the plots are not completed yet, so kind of hot off the press data. Um, what we can see is that after some initial pretreatment, all of the cells pretty much behave the same. So reference is without any polymer, and then we have 2% and 2% in red and 5% in blue. Um, the cells perform very similarly, okay? So they have some sort of activation behavior. Um, they seem to be trying to reach some sort of plateau, and then at some point they start 
to the grade. Um, this is quite surprising. This, this, the first result that is surprising is that they all behave very similarly, despite the fact that the ionic transport is so different, yeah, um, for all of these materials. So um, <clears throat> we're still trying to figure out why that is the case. Um, the the second thing that is uh, uh, that is most evident, so the, the only thing that we are able to tell in terms of a difference in incorporating the polymer is the fact that here are the differential capacity plots. So this is dQ dV as a function of, of the apply of the cell voltage, not applied to the measured cell voltage. And this is kind of like a cycle voltammogram in a way, just measure slightly different. And here what we can see is the reference um, differential plot um, has a slightly lower, sort of say, magnitude of this peak initially in the first cycle, whereas by incorporating two and 5% um, polymer, it's slightly higher, okay? Um, the, this, these peaks and the area under the peak and so on, they, this tends to be correlated to um, utilization of the cathode active material. So these peaks are related to the redox processes of the cathode active material. And what we see is that it seems that incorporating the polymer enhances at least initially, okay, in the first contact, in the first cycle, improves the contact with the cathode active material. Long-term, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. So here on this side, we have um, the 10th cycle and then in much lighter, these are the 100th cycle. Um, it doesn't look that, that much difference. I mean, here we still see in the first cycle um, that exact same difference. Um, so this is something we're trying to look into a little bit more carefully, but it already um, shows some promise in the sense of, okay, we can make these hybrid polymers, we see an effect in the transport, and then we need to explore a little bit better how this influences the, the, the performance of the cell um, long term, and especially at, at other conditions that we haven't explored yet. Um, for In terms of this project, we're trying to look into um, mechanical properties okay so maybe th there must be something happening because the ionic transport changes and so maybe it's not shown we cannot identify just by cycling maybe we need to explore other things so we're trying to think about um, mechanical properties of the composites themselves um, from a more fundamental perspective of the transport we're trying to brainstorm ways to estimate the volume occupied by the polymer so usually this tortuosity and transport is thought about volumes and not really as weight or content, like this is to describe it, um, to describe the tortuosity. Um, but this is not very easy when you're working with such small amounts of polymer. And then we are trying to identify causes for this initial activation behavior. We're more leaning towards the idea of chemical fronts, so inhomogeneous access to the cathode active material. Um, and yeah. Okay, so that's kind of that for that story. And now I would like to very rapidly switch gears to another story and that is the our what our group is currently working in terms of water processable catholytes so the group of andy soon um, a couple of years ago reported the water mediated synthesis of lithium indium chloride so this is not a thiophosphate it's a halide based lithium ion conductor but uh, the very cool thing about this material is that you can make it out of water so you make you take the precursors fix them in water you slowly heat it up and then you can actually get this um, halide con uh, lithium ion conductor um, with very nice ionic conductivities at room temperature. Okay, so um, this, this is this reported to be scalable up to 50 plus grams. And the attractive thing about the halide based um, lithium solid electrolyte is that they have a much higher oxidative stability against the, cathode, the, the oxide based cathode active material. Okay, so that's one part. And then what do we mix it with? Okay, well, um, usually um, when you think about lithium ion batteries in general, um, and even some solid state batteries, sometimes you need to add conductive carbon because you want to improve the electronic transport in the cathode so that you can actually access these high, higher C rates. Um, but the problem is there have been many, many demonstrations that the solid electrolytes, halides, thiophosphates actually degrade and decompose against carbon. So we want to try and avoid the use of carbon. Now, uh, PBDF, on the other hand, is used as the binder. So to kind of keep everything together, 
okay, during cycling and accommodate these kind of expansion and contraction of the cathode active materials. But PVDF intrinsically has a very low electrical conductivity um, and it also blocks access of the ions to the surface of the active material. So it works as a binder, right, to keep things together, but nothing else. It's pretty much dead weight in terms of transport. And so we were thinking about ways to um, kind of have the effect of a binder and provide the conductivity that required electronic conductivity in a single material. And P.PSS um, kind of popped out because P.PSS is a um, electronically conducting polymer. Um, it's widely used in all sorts of applications, also in photoelectrochemical applications, which is where my background is from. It's, it's quite stable, electrochemically high electronic conductivity, and it can actually also be processed in water. Okay, and this is where we decided, okay, well, can we have a one pot synthesis of an electro electronically conducting material with our solid electrolyte? Um, and so we, we, by we, I mean Elena, um, she developed a methodology for um, synthesizing the um, LIC, so the lithium indium chloride solid electrolyte polymer composite. And she was able to characterize that. So here you see the, the Raman spectra of the polymer um, as received. So, and the lithium indium chloride prepared without the polymer. And you can already start seeing some of the signals related to the polymer whenever you are making these things in a, in a one pot. Um, and you can also see the, the signals related to the LIC. Um, X-ray diffraction results suggest that we can actually, that the LIC is made in relatively high purity. So we're not forming any kind of funky side phases along with the process of incorporating the, the conductive polymer. Now we worked in, in collaboration uh, with Kiesin Neuhaus, uh, another group leader here at the Hinweiss Institute in Münster. And she helped us with Kelvin probe force microscopy measurements. And, and the idea here was trying to determine the location. Where is this polymer at? Is it like distributed everywhere in the sample homogeneously? Is it like clumped up, you know, agglomerated in, in different areas? And so um, with these measurements, um, Kiesin was able to show us, so I was able to learn a lot in the process about, um, for one, how does the, the, the microstructure of the composites look like? And in particular, using the phase angle images, um, identify that the lighter areas, okay, of the phase angle, so these are the indication of where the polymer is at, whereas the darker areas are um, the lithium indium chloride um, solid electrolyte, okay? Um, yeah, so we were able to combine all of these things um, and, and it looked promising in the sense that we uh, made a good composite material of a solid electrolyte conductive polymer. We mixed that with cathode active materials and um, Elena measured the partial electronic conductivity of these materials, in this case by a DC polarization. And you can see that the um, electronic conductivity increases with increasing polymer content, which is expected and which is also good. And um, then we built cells from them. These cells are slightly different than the ones that I mentioned before. We actually use a thiophosphate separator, um, then the lithium indium chloride with the PDOC PSS and the NMC, and we have the cycling performance. And in general, we see that the initial discharge capacity scale with the polymer content, but the cycling behavior and the capacity fading do not. So this is something we are still um, further exploring, and we are now going back and looking a little bit more in detail into the partial ionic, partial electronic transport in these composites and see how we can optimize it. Okay, now what is interesting about this is for one, we have kind of, a, 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 it opens the possibility to explore other greener sort of polymer additives in solid state batteries that can be processed in water, okay? So this is actually, um, you know, I hope it's a whole new world of possibilities in that sense. Um, we're also exploring the one pot preparation of catholytes. Okay, so this was also already reported by Andy Sun um, with lithium cobalt oxide, but there's many cathode active materials um, out there and we would like to explore how, um, how much can we extend this approach yeah, for one pot preparation of cathode, uh, of catholytes for solid state batteries. And we would like to build upon um, the work of colleagues here in Münster, so here at the meet, um, 
that um, have also reported aqueous processing of NMC based, LMO based, um, and all sorts of other cathode active materials. So there's a lot of opportunity for, for collaboration. Okay, and with that, um, I would like to thank you all for your time. Thank you again, the organizers, for the invitation. And I would very gladly um, take questions now. Okay, can you hear me, Nana? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for this great talk. Um, I'm opening the floor up to questions. And now I'm trying to start my video. It's not doing it. So I'm sorry for that. Oh, there it is. Here I am. Hi. <laughs> so um, I'm going to get us uh, kicked off because I actually have a couple of questions. When you um, mix your um, material with the polymer, mm -hmm. Um, do you foresee that, let's say, if you don't use um, like mortar and pestle and do it manually, but let's say you would use a ball mill um, and then maybe even explore, you know, different speeds or length scales um, in terms of time? Um, do you think this would have a big effect on um, the material, on the hybrid material and then on its performance? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, we, we know that the processing of from, from the solid electrolyte alone perspective, this definitely plays a role. Okay. Um, so the more you ball mill a solid electrolyte, usually they amorphize, the worse they get and so on. Yeah. So it does play a role in the performance. Yeah. What we are, we are definitely exploring ball milling. Um, this is part of the project. We're just not there yet with the data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but so this is, this is definitely part of the project. What we see is that, you know, it's, it, these polymers are interesting in the sense that if, at the point when you add the salt, so the lithium TFSI salt, for example, into the polymer electrolyte, the mechanical properties of the polymer change significantly. It kind of becomes quite sticky. And so stickiness is never good for ball mill, <laughs> um, uh, at, at least if you want to recover your material afterwards. Um, and so there's been a, Sebastian uh, is the one that is um, working on this project. He's actually working through a little bit of trial and error and trying to identify what to mix and when um in the ball mill so that he can actually recover the most of his product um so that he can actually measure something with it um yeah so this is definitely the case we we don't have the answer to that yet but what we definitely expect is of course that the distribution is more homogeneous um or at least perhaps more reproducible yeah than just um, mortar and pestle and yeah this is i would say to be determined and to be published. I don't know once we have the data. <laughs> Great. Um, into the audience, you can indicate in the chat if you have a question or just unmute yourself um, and ask your question. Um, I have a second one um, for that might be a little bit naive um, and kind of maybe bigger picture. Again, for your polymers, since there's so many polymers out there, do you do any sort of maybe with the theoretical approach, um, mining of existing polymers in, in kind of guiding which ones you're actually using for your experiments or um, do yeah, you it, choose ones that have a certain conductivity? How, how, how do you choose them? So, so I am going to be very honest about how we chose these ones. These ones we chose because we had access to them. Um, <laughs> so P.PSS from, it was from the perspective of it's commercially available, it's very well-established material and we wanted to kind of develop a model system to figure out if this works. And, and so we went with that from the perspective of electronically conducting. But of course, once you demonstrate the concept then you can try and identify, okay, do we need a more conducting polymer, a less conducting one? What is the stability um, uh, against the other stuff, the long-term performance? And then you, you can start, the perhaps identifying principle like guidelines to, to know where to go. Um, that's from the perspective of the conductive polymer. From the perspective of the elect polymer electrolytes, our institute, they, this is what they do, right? They develop electrolytes uh, for all sorts of battery applications. And so we pretty much just walked down the hall and talked to colleagues and said, you know, what's your best performing polymer and can we test it? Um, 
I think if, if at some point we I, actually my student and I just had discussions like why did we choose this very complex polymer and didn't we just start with like I don't know another version of PEO it's like well because PEO everyone can do that at least this is a little bit of a, a little bit special and then it opens up more the possibility for collaboration um, so we have to wait and see where the the kind of detailed transport analysis goes and what does it tell us in terms of can we go with something simpler or do we actually need something more tailored yeah um and um yeah i think we just need to wait to see what the data tells us and where to go and then definitely once we have that contact our theoretician friends to tell us okay can you please screen all of the polymers that you can find and tell us okay let's try and target that one yeah, yeah that's the very rich um, project. <laughs> um, are there other questions from the audience? I don't want to take up all of the Q and A time here. I don't see anything in the chat, and I don't hear anybody speaking up. So maybe I'll ask one more question to give people the chance uh, to to think about if they if they want to ask you something. Um, again, for the polymers, sorry, I keep going back to the polymers because yeah, we are also thinking about polymer hybrids. That's why I'm kind of mm -hmm. like in that mindset right now. Um, yep. You said you're heating them up um, after you yep. mix them. Um, do you do, um, I'm guessing you're not going to go to very high temperatures to not lose the, the polymer. Um, do you do any sorts of structural analysis or maybe not structural, but maybe IR, um, something like that after the heating step, just to see if you disintegrated and kind of lost your polymer or um, is so, that of concern? No, so, we, so we don't heat them that much. We only heat them um, a little bit above their melting point and they definitely melt below 100 Celsius. So um, we don't expect the, the heating step to neither affect the solid electrolyte nor the polymer electrolyte significantly. Um, this is the, the temperature above, above the temperature at which it melts and colleagues, this is the temperature colleagues told us, okay, this is the melting temperature. Um, this is how they prepare films of the polymers yeah, when they actually wanna prepare them as thin films for membranes and so on, like actually processable um, plastic membranes. So the idea was to say, okay, if the polymer is not well distributed, it's heated up and maybe it flows around a little bit and then keeps everything a little bit better together. And in fact, we do see some change in the properties of the pellet after it's being heated uh, or it has been heated up, um, but it doesn't seem to affect significantly cycling performance. And so this is definitely counterintuitive to me, but what I, I think, is happening is the fact that um I will go there very quickly yeah, here you know we are we are cycling these cells at 50 megapascals of applied pressure okay so this is still very 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 high um we definitely want to go much lower than that if we're looking into any applications and so this is also then the next step to look at the effect of the applied pressure or so how does the cycling performance look like at lower applied pressures um, when we have these polymers, because maybe this is why we don't see any differences because there's just so much pressure that is just keeping everything together fine. And so we cannot see this effect, this mechanical property effect of the incorporating the polymer in the, yeah, at the cell level. So this is why we wanted to look at the mechanical properties first and then maybe the cycling. Great. I think there's so a question on there's the There's a chat. question in the chat. Yeah, let me read it out. <laughs> Um, thank you for the great talk. Does your laboratory or the Helmholtz Institute Münster work with industry to develop similar solid state battery technology for outside applications? Or is most of your work focused on advancing existing academic research? Mm, very good question. Um, so one advantage that Helmholtz Institute Münster has as a location of research is that we are actually very much at the interface of academic research and, and let's say more applied. So um, very academic research takes place at the university, of course, um, but um, the Mead Institute, um, uh, which is the Münster Electrochemical Energy Technology Center, um, has been here for 15 years. Um, they actually, I don't know if the audience is familiar with the concept of TRL level, like TRL um, of projects, so technology readiness level. 
And so you go from like zero to one, this is like academic research. And I think the highest one is nine. And this is pretty much like going into a commercial application. So university zero to one, our institute is let's say one to three. Um, so trying to move a little bit beyond um, academic. The meat itself, it's probably somewhere between three and six. Okay, so they're a little bit advanced. And then most recently, there's a new um, Fraunhofer Institute that, that is being built and designed here in Münster. Um, it's the, um, the FFB, Forschungsfabrik uh, Battery, so uh, the battery factory lab, kind of. So the idea is that there's going to be this massive space where one can actually rent uh, equipment and utilize and in, in, develop projects to really upscale everything in such a way that this can be become a real product that can be sell that can be sold so you can optimize the processing at the level of the ffb at the front over and then once those conditions have been identified then the companies can take it and then upscale it in their in their giga factories or whatever um, so we have a lot of interaction with many institutions that have different levels of the research and so that allows for a lot of collaboration and a lot of like knowledge transfer so to say um our institute here so the meat itself has recently uh, been awarded uh, one of these um lg uh, research projects so we're, co we're collaborating so we have a um so shirley main got one um <clears throat> in san diego before uh, before she uh, before she left and and martin got the other one for the meat so we're collaborating very closely uh, me not personally but the institute itself so i think there's a little bit of everything um uh, my group uh, itself we're a little bit more focused on on the academic level at the moment we started two and a half years ago with this topic um but the possibilities are very much uh open and very optimistic because there's really a lot of fertile ground yeah to to develop something more that goes to more applied research Great. Okay, so last chance to ask a question for the audience. Go ahead. Three, two, one. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Nella, for a fantastic talk. We thank love you again, having you again. here on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate and um, everybody else, have a good day whatever time zone you're in Nella enjoy your firearm beer when you get home thank you uh, say hi to, to the family and I will uh, yeah everybody else uh, take care and uh, join us again uh, for our next material seminar you are